Good morning and welcome to the first of five webinars we're holding on successive days this week under the title After Strange Ways. My name is Richard Garside and I'll be hosting this morning's webinar. The five webinars which start today mark the 30th anniversary of the 1990 Strange Ways prison protest and the official report into those protests by Lord Justice Wolf and Sir Stephen Tunin, a report that was published 30 years ago this week. Over the next five days, we will discuss the background to the Strange Ways prison protest and recount what happened in those 25 days in April 1990. The Strange Ways prison protest in April 1990 remains the longest and most significant protest in British prisons history. Over the next five days, we will also discuss what has happened in prisons since the protest in 1990. Has the situation improved over the past 30 years, as many reformers hoped and expected? Has it changed at all, or indeed got worse, as many argue? Finally, we will discuss what the future might bring. The prison population has more than doubled in the 30 years since the Strange Ways prison protest. Is it possible to imagine and work towards a world less marked by prison or without prisons at all? During the webinars this week, you can use the Q&A function to put questions to the panellists. And that's the function you'll find at the bottom of your screen if you're using the Zoom app. If you see a question from someone else you would like to see answered, you can give it a thumbs up using the upvote function and this will increase the chances that we will come to the question in the discussion section following the, the initial presentations. Now this webinar didn't organise itself. I'd like in particular to offer a special thanks to Professor Joe Sim uh, of Liverpool John Moores University. Uh, Joe and I cooked up the idea for the series last year after the COVID event, uh, COVID crisis rather put paid to an event that we had planned to hold last April to mark the 30th anniversary of the Strange Ways prison protest. At this morning's webinar, you'll be hearing from three speakers. In a bit, Eric Allison, the prison's correspondent for The Guardian, will talk about what he saw in Strange Ways during his time there in the 1960s and 1970s. He will be followed by Elaine Player, Professor of Criminology and Criminal Justice at King's College London, who will talk about the culture and reality of prisons in the years leading up to the Strange Ways protest. But first, it gives me great pleasure to introduce the filmmaker Rex Bloomstein, creator of the iconic BAFTA award-winning Strange Ways series, a six-part fly on the wall documentary on the prison, on Strange Ways Prison, which was broadcast by the BBC in 1980. Rex is going to share some clips from that, um, from that documentary series and also talk about uh, the making of that programme and what he saw there. Um, and all I'd say is bear with us, uh, we're trying to share these videos via Zoom. Uh, it might be a little bit scratchy, mumpy around the edges, uh, but in the final uh, video of this uh, of this session, uh, which which is being recorded and will be on our YouTube account uh, later this afternoon, we'll iron out all those rough edges. So there'll be a nice clean copy, even if uh, if the next 10, 20 minutes uh, the video is is slightly shaking, crackling in places. Uh, so uh, Rex, um, if you'd like to to join us, and we will uh, get going with your presentation. Over to you, Rex. Thank you. Uh, good morning, uh, everybody. Um, I'd like to thank Richard and the Centre for Crime and Justice Study Studies for the opportunity to present some thoughts and reflections, as well as some, uh, some excerpts from my eight-part BBC television series, Strange Ways, which I made in 1980. And in doing so, I hope to provide some background and context to the protest and the ensuing riot that took place in 1990, 10 years after making the series, and hopefully contribute to this conference's core theme, the profound challenges facing 
the prison system today since the Wolf Report on that riot was published, as Richard said, 30 years ago. By the end of the 1970s, I, having made several films on criminal justice, my most ambitious aim was to document the prison itself. Unless you worked inside a jail, what did the rest of society know about incarceration? Wasn't it important to understand what went on in such a public institution that appeared, in my view, so unjustifiably secretive? What was prison life really like? Up till then, it wasn't documentary that was thought to offer the best insight behind the walls for that marvellous comedy series, Porridge. At the time, there was thought to be serious overcrowding within the prison system, where amongst others, fine defaulters, people convicted of theft of every type and description, drug dealers, etc., etc., jostled with a minority of violent offenders. A prison population overwhelmingly working class with, as we know, much higher levels of illiteracy, abused childhoods, many coming from criminal subcultures, significant levels of mental illness and addiction, and so on. I also remember it was the May Committee set up to look at industrial relations in prisons who extended their mandate and came up with the notion of positive custody. The possibility of change was in the air. However, the prison population had reached the shocking total of 47,000 people. Hard to believe, but there was genuine concern at this number of prisons, prisoners in England and Wales. And I believe a powerful factor in senior prison management being prepared to consider my request for a major fly on the wall series where nothing was off limits. This was the key to really capturing prison life as far as it, was, as it was possible to do so. The willingness to risk the cold eye of the camera. By this time, my previous films on the criminal justice system, such as The Sentence, Release, Prisoner's Wives, Parole, were known to the prison authorities, as was my insistence that in the end it was a question of trust, because the editorial control lay only with me and the broadcaster, which of course it had to. Finally, in 1979, after pretty intense negotiations, the prison service agreed to go ahead, and I was given unprecedented access to film inside HMP Manchester, better known as Strange Ways. Whilst I had the crucial and total support of Governor Norman Brown, I still had to confront the fears and suspicions of the POA and prison staff, who believed the series would be, as they put it, another stitch up, another example of being depicted in a cruel, and bullying way as seen in various drama productions of the time. The only assurance I gave was that I would seek the truth. In the end, most members of staff came on board, as did most of the inmates I asked to appear. So many of these prisoners said to me how glad they were that the public would at last see the reality of living in a giant, overcrowded local Victorian jail. I should point out that the scenes of prison life that we captured then, such as three men to a cell with a bucket as a toilet, the routines and the confrontations had barely been witnessed before. I called the first episode a human warehouse. Here is part of the opening sequence introducing Strange Ways to a television audience on BBC One of some eight billion people. Trevor had been out of Borstal only three days when he was arrested and subsequently convicted for theft of a motor car. Just three days of freedom, then three weeks on remand, and now his first night in strange ways. Bailey, 31. Gavin, 31.
Did you get all your gear? Are you saving gear? I think so, yeah. I got one, supposed to happen. Two Me for the next few weeks. All right, lads? Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. A vast range of petty crime is represented in a local prison like Strangeways. The average stay is six to nine months. The most common offence, burglary. You. You. Society has exacted its revenge on the hundreds of men sleeping in these wings. They have lost their freedom. But for the vast majority, the punishment they endure will neither reform nor rehabilitate. The titles of the other episodes reveal the different perspectives within this extraordinary community. Screws, the defensive, often tense and sometimes dangerous world of the prison officer. Cons, inmates talking, surviving in an overcrowded universe. They call us beasts, the name given by other prisoners to the despised and rejected sex offenders held on a separate wing for their own safety. Christmas. Christmas Day in the jail, priests and prisoners, a Christmas meal, a Salvation Army. Forstal boys, 15 and 16 year olds, held in a separate block in the prison, awaiting their dispersal to Borstals, now of course abolished. Here is a sequence from Borstal boys. A young offender called Paul is in the hospital wing. He's attempted suicide. The prison's senior medical officer, on his rounds, I stopped to talk to him. I can still barely believe the advice he gives. It stayed with me, and so has the memory of Paul. Morning. Hey. You're the terror of Salford, aren't you? Yes, According to the local authority. Is that right? How come that you uh, have got that reputation? Also, being Holmes. Yeah, I'm scunted from Holmes. You like running away, do you? You don't like stopping. <laughs> <laughs> because I mean, you're what? You're 16 now, yes, and certainly uh, you're doing it the hard way, aren't you? Really, at your age. What's all this um, wrist business too? Your wrist, right. When did you do that? Seven, I don't know, just a Just that one? Seven. When did you do that one? Seven, please, sir. Mm -hmm. And they tell me that you did, uh, tried to do something at Risley too. Yes, what did you do there? Just to hang myself there. What was that for? Just didn't like the place. Well, you were giving it a bad reputation, weren't you? I mean, that's no way to cure things, is it? You look like a lively lad to me, not one that would go one to do yourself in. You're not serious, are you? Time, sir. That's about time you did. You're 16, you're growing up, aren't you? Start acting like it. Instead of like a kid. People will treat you like a man if you behave like one. What you want, isn't it? 
Okay. Anyway, you've got a sentence to get on with now, haven't you? You're going to get on with it. But, okay. When I was in uh, Vizsla, I tried to hang myself in the cell, but that didn't work. So then I went to um, the Crescent, I mean, um, the courts, and um, they sent me back to Vizsla. And when I was in the cell, I ripped a piece of steel off the air ventilation and I slashed my wrists. And the uh, coppers come in and they took me to the hospital. Straight from there, Come straight to strange ways. And allocate from Barcelona and I'll wait for Barcelona. What's it what's it been like for you being in a prison for the first time? When you're fifteen years old and you're in prison. Yeah. Well, it's been horrible really. But I'm in the hospital wing and it's all right up there, it's better in the cells. What's going to happen to you? Well, I'm going to Barcelona, I'd had to do six months to two years in the Boston. And then when I come out of Boston, I'm just going to find a job, find a room, because I'm not going back to my parents when I get out. Because if I go back there, I'll only have more trouble on my back with my mum and dad. And then, um, see, the other kids are going to start getting put in homes themselves now. Like two twins, they're going to get put in homes. And them two will have to come themselves. So I'm not going home when I get out. Other programs included The Block, The Punishment Landing, where they kept those who had transgressed against the system. Filming there led to a further episode, which I called The Allegation. The film centered on Ian Smith, an addict and recidivist, who self-harmed by swallowing spoons, knives, any object he could get his hands on. He got himself into trouble and whilst down on the block had made what was known in official terms then as an allegation of brutality against a prison officer. We asked and were allowed to film the whole process of investigation as it unfolded, ending in a closed trial inside the prison, adjudicated by two members of the Board of Visitors as they were called then. They were both serving magistrates who had the power to add months to a man's sentence. Ian was allowed to call witnesses, but access to a lawyer was denied. There was no jury, no public, no reporters. I think it a pretty rare example of justice actually being dispensed. So having heard the evidence, the magistrates decided that the allegation was false and malicious. They discussed what punishment Ian must receive. What you'll see unfold is a shortened version of what then took place. I suppose we've got to take seriously into account the repercussions on the officer had the case been proved, not been proved, and the fact that the officer would have then been in serious difficulties um, as to his future, I suppose, because he would, by implication, have not been telling the truth. Exactly. And therefore the offence is a serious one. It is a serious um, charge. But his record in prison has not been too bad, and I agree with your... Yeah. 40 days, which is not particularly severe. Nor is severe, 40 days a severe penalty severe for, this time, for this type of offence in this establishment. And that is due to the fact that he has, until now, a fairly clean prison record. Yeah, and 14, 14 day, days. 14 days loss of earnings, and privileges and associated, associated work. work. Yes. Fine. So we'll have, uh, is the record up to date? Yes, thank you. So we'll have the man back and tell him. Can we have Smith, Mr. Green, yeah, please? Yeah. Well, Smith, we have decided that you will lose 40 days remission and that there will be a loss of 14 days earnings, privileges, and associated work. Thank you. 
doctor in here, and I'll put him, and I'll punch him right between the eyeballs. You just say as you are for a second, because you're only going to the junior. I don't give a shit. I'm going to crack it open. Why don't you say that? All right, sir. Now, Smith, I've just had a word with the doctor. He agrees that the best place for you is in the hospital. And we do not wish you to injure yourself. So it would be best if you if you went on your own accord, accompanied by the officer. The slippers there. Two splitches at home, so consistently. And I was just Such was Strange Ways in 1980, the scenes you've witnessed are history. I remember throughout the three months of filming, the tensions inside the prison were palpable. My hope was that by revealing the squalor, by making our audience aware that men were sharing cells with a bucket as a toilet, that the myriad of human problems so apparent amongst prisoners were barely being dealt with, that all this would be a spur to the process of desperately needed reform and a reduction in the prison population. Well, that was a pretty forlorn hope. In the year 2000, 20 years later, I made a film for the BBC series Time Watch called Strange Ways Revisited. As the title suggests, I wanted to look back to compare and contrast the changes that had taken place. Here is one of the prisoners from our original 1980 series called Vinnie Valenti, whose prescient words foreshadow what was to occur 10 years later. Uh, the place wants closing down, believe me. I don't know about Rizla getting closed down. This place should be closed down because this nick is run by the screws because there's not a car in here got any bottle. There's none of them got any bottle. They're all doing... They mix them up six weekers with three weekers. They don't put all the bob together. If they put all them up together, they'd be, they, this place would have gone up years ago. But I'll tell you something. This place will go off. And when this place does go off, the roof will go, man. I'm telling you. Ten years after the BBC series, Strange Ways erupted into the worst prison riot this country has ever seen. It began at mid-morning in the prison chapel. In a clearly planned assault, up to 50 prisoners forced their way onto the roof and began tearing up the tiles. Reports said more than a thousand inmates were running loose and that parts of the prison were being barricaded. It took the authorities 25 days before they regained control of the prison.
Some parts of Strangeways look as if they've been hit by bombs. The fire damage is extensive. Men took their revenge on the cells which used to keep them in custody. The railings were stripped from the landings. The hazards of walking along them now are obvious. The difficulty of doing so during an assault with missiles raining down from above are quite vividly illustrated. Inside Strangeways are the graffiti scrawled by prisoners. One asks, we wonder why. Perhaps our series played a part, however small, in helping to bring about some of the changes that have occurred. The degrading process of slopping out as now in-cell sanitation or witnessing the questionable role of boards visitors now replaced by independent monitoring boards. Disciplinary issues seem more in a human rights context that can also be dealt with by outside bodies. I think these were positive steps, as was Sir Martin Neri's attempt at a decency agenda in later years. But fundamental reform eludes us. We remain the country with the largest prison population in Western Europe. The answer to that question scrawled on the wall of that ruined landing, we wonder why, is even more urgent. And it's a good moment for me to end. Thanks for watching. Thank you, Rex. It's, um, I mean, that, that incident with Paul is just kind of, I don't know, almost beggars belief, actually. And I, I wonder in terms of your experience of when you were filming that original documentary and, uh, and obviously the subsequent uh, documentary, which I thought was really moving because you went back and spoke to a number of the former prisoners and saw how they were getting on or in some cases weren't getting on. So I was kind of wondering, how did it leave you kind of feeling having filmed that documentary and some of, I mean, was, was there stuff there that you, it must have really shocked you, some of the, some of the events you saw in Strangers back in that original, um, when you were doing those original films? Yes, I mean, of course it did. I mean, anybody going into a prison for the first time is always wary and I think People have often said to me, I'm quite frightened, you know, our images, our stereotypes of prison. But you know, there is this, <clears throat> excuse me, human process of adjustment. And this process of adjustment is both good and bad because it enables you to survive, but it also numbs you and you become literally adjusted to the, to the situation, to, the, to living there. And people get through, they have to get through. And my sense of shock, I think, wore away. I became adjusted to going in. It took us three months to make that series. And um, I sort of, you know, you, you begin to accept the realities in the most strange sort of way. Um, but that process of adjustment does, of course, um, stop me remembering some of the scenes. And I felt very strongly that, I really felt that we could help bring about some change. And it was so, so desperately disappointing when the forces of reaction, um, the profound inequalities, the attempt to try and do something worthwhile, rehabilitate and so on, was so difficult to achieve in those conditions. Um, so yes, I was shocked, but I, I got used to it. And yes, I hoped it would change things. Um, and it, it led, to, led to other things. And I think it... We mustn't forget the thousands and thousands of men who are in there now. So there has to be as much that could be done to help them get through, um, et cetera, et cetera. But we might talk about that. Thank you. And, and we'll, we'll move on in a second. But there's, um, there's a question from, from one of the attendees here who um, says, is there any follow-up information on Paul? So did you, did you manage? Yes, to um, Paul is a, a tragic story. I made, when I made Strange Ways Revisited, which we showed the last episode, um, I found Paul, uh, I found, I, when I say I found Paul, I tried to find Paul and indeed found his family. Paul had, at um, uh, the age of about 21, had, uh, when drunk and with drugs, literally slipped into one of the canals then and drowned. So Paul died at an early age. His actual life was appalling 
when I found out more about it um, from his, I think about uh, seven or eight brothers and sisters, um, the, his parents, his father was so brutalized and so brutalized the family. It was, it was pretty devastating. It's a devastating story. So when that uh, senior medical officer says to him, grow up, you know, be a man, when he's never been a child, I, I just thought, how could you say those sorts of things? And maybe he himself, the senior medic officer, had seen so many people in that prison. He himself, you know, what sensit sensitivities could he retain in that environment? But um, it seemed to be telling, and I'm interested that you, you found it so. Okay, well, that's, that's, uh, yeah, that's very sad. And I think, you know, one of the many examples of just how harmful and damaging prisons can be, both for prisoners and, and, and indeed their families. Uh, Rex, thank you for now. Uh, I'm sure I can see there are questions now coming in, uh, which, is, which is really good. And I'm sure we'll want to come back to, to some of those other questions. Uh, and, and do keep your questions coming in. We'll get through as many as we can. Uh, but for now, Rex, thank you very much. And I'm um, wondering if now, if Eric can join us. And uh, Eric, would you like to unmute yourself and, um, and, and start your video? If you can hear me. If not, this could be. Oh. Right, how's that? Can we? We can hear you. Um, are you, are you able to start your your video or um, are we going to do it without video, which is fine, obviously? Uh, I'm not sure it should be on. Um, not for the first time, I'm having technical problems, so. All right, well, look, at least we can hear you and that's the, that's the main thing. So um, uh, let, let's, let's move on. Now, Eric, I mean, you're, you're the, currently the Guardian's prison correspondence and I think it's true to say you're the only, oh, here we go, lovely. Um, the only um, journalist currently working for a major news outlet with a specific responsibility for covering um, what's going on in prisons. Uh, uh, but you also have a, you know, a particular sort of background and experience of the prison system in the, uh, in the 60s and 70s, including strange ways. Uh, so uh, it'd be really good to hear your thoughts and reflections on 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 that experience and uh and over to you now okay yes and it was the 80s and 90s as well uh, richard it was um my career as a criminal was um spread over the best part of five decades uh first of all um a great pleasure to uh follow rex very hard act to follow of course um I'm pleased to say that he's a friend of mine, and of course he's a brilliant, um, he's a brilliant journalist. Uh, journalist, and I remember vividly when the when the Strange Ways program went out, and um, I watched it with people, uh, one of my brothers, because um, I was the only member of my family who ever got in trouble, you know. But my um, and one of my brothers who. He'd been in the army and he did things properly and he said that staff were behaving badly but they didn't know they were behaving badly they didn't realize and that was rex's uh, great gift you know that he, he it was to fly on the wall and he just let people get on with it you know but um yeah and i had a a, a pretty big history with um with strange ways because of course i'm from manchester and it was my local prison and in 1990, um, Strange Ways had a lot in common with all the other old Victorian uh, local prisons, you know, the dustbins of the, of the penal system, if you like. It was, um, it was overcrowded um, and the regime was poor. Um, and one visit a month, 30 minutes, um, one letter a week. Uh, or one free letter a week um, and one bath a week lousy food um, it was dirty and it was overcrowded um, but really those characteristics were shared by 
most of the other local jails, uh, Liverpool and uh, Leeds, Armley and uh, Winston Green and, uh, and Wilmot Scrubs, uh, Durham, you know, they were all, they all, you know, shared those same uh, poor regime. Um, but what made Strangeways different was that it wasn't run by the prison service and it wasn't run by uh, the various governors that they'd had. It was run by the screws. It was a screws nick. Um, they ran it and, and they let you know it. And successive governors had let them uh, run it. You know, they'd not upset the apple cart. Um, and ironically, um, at the time of the riot, Strangeways had by far, by a long, long chalk, the best governor that um, it had ever had in Brendan or Friedel. He was a, a decent man um, and he wanted to introduce reforms um, and the staff didn't want it. They didn't like it. Uh, they passed a vote of no confidence in him um, a couple of weeks before the riot and then as I helped to explain um, in the book that I wrote with, uh, with my friend Nicky, um, when I went to the Wolf Inquiry and I intended every day of the Wolf Inquiry, um, and then I found out then, astonishingly, because of course I wasn't in there at the time of the riot, otherwise I'd have joined in, of course, but astonishingly, the staff knew it was gonna kick off that morning and they allowed it to happen they actually wanted um, a quiet riot, you know, so that then they could say to the governor, well, here's what you get when you start, give them in, you know, you give these people an inch and they'll take a mile. What they didn't take into account was the, the volume of the hatred uh, that was felt um, by the prisoners who'd suffered there over the decades. And when it went off, it, it went off in good style and uh, yeah and I made it my business to attend every day of the riot um, and show my support to the lads on the roof and then um, as I say I when I found out what had happened I then you know decided to um, you know try and set it down and uh, because people need to know what's going on and um, even now, you know, we don't know what goes on in these in, in these local jails. I mean, how many people pass by strain, uh, strange ways, Liverpool, Wormwood Scrubs every day, and yet for all that they know of what goes on in there, um, it might as well be in Timbuktu. And we ought to know because how we, how we treat people um, when they're in prison, will have a marked effect on the way they treat us when they come out of prison. Um, and we've a long, long way to go yet, uh, without a shadow of a doubt. So, yeah, uh, pretty depressing. Um, and the situation now is in many ways, in some ways anyway, uh, probably worse than it was then. Um, and, and particularly um, in the lockdown. So yeah, we need to, there's a lot needs to be done to get us, uh, you know, we need to try and work towards a decent and, um, and humane prison system and we're a long, long way from it. Thank you very much, Eric. Um, you said that when the protest was unfolding, you you made it a made it a point to go down uh, most days to show your support. I mean, I mean, I, re I remember you know seeing the footage of the of the protest on the television news uh, at the time. Uh, I'd have been in my early twenties then, and it, it kind of seemed like news from a different world for me. And of course, it came. The protest started just the day after the poll tax right uh, and was portrayed obviously as a very controversial uh, you know and kind of indeed dangerous and appalling act so how was what was your sense of how it was experienced in Manchester itself and around the prison was there were there a lot of people who were 
going to the prison to show their support? Were they were they hurling abuse? Were they, you know, uh, there in a hostile way or in a friendly way? Or was it a bit of a mixture? Oh, without a doubt, the vast majority of people who, who attended, and some days it was <laughs> it was amazing, you know, there were several hundred people outside, you know, and um, almost without exception, they were there supporting the prisoners, you know, they were friends and relatives um, of, um, of prisoners. And I remember going down one day um, and talking to this guy, and he came from Hartlepool. And he'd done one sentence in strange ways, and it was the only sentence he'd ever done. Um, he'd done a six-month uh, sentence. He'd got, um, I think he was sentenced, what well, he was, he was sentenced in Yorkshire, and went to Armley, but then they used to move them from Armley and other prisons, you know, to uh, strange ways. And um, he, he said, I had to come down, he said, and, and just show these lads, uh, you know, the support. So because I'd never forgotten um, just how bad this place was, you know. So, yeah, my, um, yeah, my heart went out to those lads on the roof. I knew uh, they were they were brave men uh, because I knew and they knew what they would get, you know, what they would be facing uh, when the riot ended. Um, but they just said, you know, this, you know, you can't treat people this way. Um, and so, yeah, the, the, the atmosphere, it was almost like a carnival, um, for many days, you know, and into the night as well, because when the pubs closed in the evenings, again, that was the, that was part of the, of the Manchester night scene, if you like, you know, to go. Uh, to go and stand outside uh, Strange Ways. And yeah, I was there until the very last day and then kept in touch with a lot of the main players um, afterwards and um, and supported them. Um, and of course, they did pay for it. You know, they were... <laughs> and they knew perfectly well that, um, that they would pay for it. So, yeah, they were brave men, in my opinion. And when you watch those those clips from Rex's documentary I mean a number of those scenes must must have felt eerily familiar to you I, I, I just wonder how you now with a you know 30 40 years on what's your reflection now looking at those that footage and do you feel that things have changed at all is it much the same well, first of all, down the block, you know, D1, that's the segregation unit or the block, as we call them. Um, ironically, they now call it the, um, well, they used to call it the punishment block. And then, then they started calling it the segregation unit. And now they call it care and separation <laughs> uh, unit, I think, you know. But, um, uh, and, and of course, that was where all the bad stuff went on because, you know, that's a prison within a prison. Um, and they could just get away with what they wanted down there. And it really, really took me back. And, um, um, yeah, I felt, I felt a bit of a shiver there, actually. You know, when I I put myself down into the block again because I spent quite a lot of time in the segregation unit because um, I used to speak my mind, you know, and it's not a good idea uh, in prison. But, um, yeah, we need... There's an awful lot still to be done. There really is, you know. I, uh, yeah, uh, and I don't see much. Um, I don't see much hope of reform in the immediate future. Thank you very much. Um, we questions are continuing to come in, which is which is really good. Uh, keep. Putting those questions in, we'll bring as many to the panellists as we can. Uh, but for now, thank you, Eric. That was uh, it's really, um, you know, significant and really helpful contextualisation. And um, those who want to hear more from Eric, he's also going to be joining us at the webinar on Friday, uh, where we're going to be talking about what the future might bring uh, for for prisons and the prison system. So if you haven't registered for the Friday webinar, please do. 
and uh, we'll be continuing the conversation, of course, during the course of the week. Uh, but for now, Eric, thank you very much. Uh, that was a, was a wonderful presentation. Uh, our next speaker is Elaine Player. Elaine, would you like to uh, join us? Here we go. Yeah. Lovely. Um, and Elaine is Professor of Criminal Justice and Criminology, I've got that the right way around, at uh, King's College London and has written extensively uh, about the prison systems and indeed strange ways either side of the protests. So Elaine, over to you. Thank you Richard and good morning everyone and thanks so much to Rex and Eric for those amazing insights. My job is to provide an oversight of uh, what prisons were like back in 1990 and a number of the issues I'm going to be addressing will be picking up on the points that uh, both Eric and Rex were making. Um, I've, divided, I've divided what I want to say into um, two themes really. The first is the insularity of the prison service at that time and the second is the, the sense of a penal crisis, both of which were uh, discussed earlier. Insularity, um, the first thing uh, to think about is that they were very inward looking prisons at that time. Uh, there were very few independent providers of services at that particular instant in time. There were very little contact with the perspectives and values of people who were working with uh, similar client groups, but were approaching it in a rather different way. So very, very little value, very little um, contact with people uh, who had rather different perspectives and different values. Private prisons weren't to come on stream until 1992. Very importantly, um, primary health care was provided in-house. It was outside the NHS. Prison doctors were employed by the prison service. We had that wonderful clip from Rex's film about the, uh, how the doctor was responding to that young person. Um, it obviously raised real ethical questions about the standards and equivalence of care, uh, the confidentiality of medical information. Also, there were really major concerns about the relationship between prison doctors and the process of punishment. How medical treatment or the lack of medical treatment, withdrawal of medical treatment or denial of medical treatment were used for control purposes. And we had hints of that in, in Rex's films as well. Opportunities for contact with families and friends. Eric just said, you know, the, the limited contact he had. Wolf doubled the visiting allowance. And of course, pay phones were introduced. Pay phones were simply not available at that time. Well, the final thing to mention, I'm going to mention anyway, in relation to insularity. I think it's evident from the way in which previous riots had been responded to, which was principally through internal review mechanisms. Uh, findings weren't uh, always reported, at least to the public, or if reports were introduced and published, they were sometimes uh, published in redacted form. So, insularity, prison crisis. Um, when we talk about a crisis, we're normally talking about a specific troubled moments in time. But here, what we're really talking about is a chronic state of crisis, which is slightly contradictory in terms, of course. I'm going to address the crisis under these four headings of purpose, crisis of purpose in prisons, the crisis over staffing, again, Rex mentioned that, uh, the crisis of course over conditions, and perhaps most importantly of all, a crisis of legitimacy in the ways in which prisoners were treated. So a crisis of purpose. By the 1980s, we'd seen the demise of rehabilitation as an organising principle in prison and the rise of what was often referred to as a systems management approach, the development of managerialism within the public sector. And in relation to prisons, the content of this was driven principally at this time by concerns about prison security. There had been uh, a number of high profile escapes, and so resources were shifted from 
work and education budgets to upgrade prison security. In relation to the treatment of prisoners, the aspiration I remember being promoted at that time was humane containment, clearly a very, a very limited uh, ambition. The 1980s also saw a lot of industrial action, um, industrial action by the PLA. Margaret Thatcher was continuing to develop policies to break the power of trade unions. In relation to prisons, this had already started by the introduction of new working contracts called Fresh Start, which were introduced in 1987, which improved the basic pay, uh, but it left most prison officers with a pay cut because they were no longer allowed to have or to do the extensive overtime that they were used to. So morale was certainly low amongst the staff. Prison officers felt uh, undervalued by politicians and the public, and they felt unsupported by prison governors. A major source of conflict was over the question of safe working. The PLA claimed that the prisons were understaffed and they refused to unlock prisoners with unsafe staffing levels, what they considered to be unsafe staffing levels. And so inevitably this uh, problem with industrial relations in prisons affected the amount of time that prisoners had out of their cells, the time that they had for uh, meaningful activities. Staffing issues clearly fed into a crisis in conditions. By 1990, there was a chronic lack of purposeful activity across the estate. And as we've heard already, this was exacerbated by prison overcrowding, which was particularly concentrated, as we know, in local prisons. Although the Conservative government had embarked on the biggest prison building programme since the Victorian era, these establishments were simply adding to the existing estate rather than replacing the most dilapidated uh, institutions. So the estate was expanding, the, the, the population was expanding, but the old prisons were not being closed and very little was being done to uh, deal with the state of disrepair. So most prisons, it's, it's fair to say, I think, were in a very poor state of repair and routinely described as squalid by those outsiders who did eventually get in to see them. But the, the really important point I want to make about conditions is that in 1990, there were no minimum standards that establishments had to meet. There was no benchmark beneath which a prison should not fall, or if it did fall, uh, the prison that would then be closed. There were no minimum standards at all. And on top of this was crown immunity from prosecution, which basically meant that health and safety legislation was irrelevant because it couldn't be enforced against the crown state. But the, the crisis over prisons was not just about the state of the buildings, it was also about prison culture and the values and assumptions that shaped how prisoners were treated. And this leads us to the the fourth element of the crisis that I want to talk to, and as I said, probably the most important element, which is the crisis of legitimacy in the exercise of power. Fundamental to the status of prisoners has been the concept of less eligibility. They are, by definition, less deserving than the rest of us. And this assumption was very evident in prisons in 1990. Prison regimes were built on the notion that prisoners would be granted privileges. Uh, these privileges, of course, could be taken away uh, at the discretion of prison staff. There was no recognition that prisoners had entitlements, let alone, uh, let alone rights. Even Wolf backed away from uh, the notion of prisoners' rights and talked about legitimate expectations. 30 years ago, prisoners had no entitlement to be given uh, reasons for decisions that profoundly affected them. So denial of parole, security classification, if you're being transferred to another prison, you were not entitled to any reasons for those decisions that being taken. And 
and this is terribly important as well, there was virtually no effective and independent process by which prisoners could complain. Um, because of this lack of credibility that the internal grievance procedures had amongst the prison population, prisoners looked beyond the prison walls for some kind of resolution. And so in the, the 1980s, we see a growing number of legal challenges where prisoners have turned to the courts. Both judicial review in the domestic courts and cases that, are take, that were taken to the European Court of Human Rights were being won by prisoners. The judges, both our domestic judges and the judges in Strasbourg, were showing a greater willingness to intervene in relation to certain areas of prison life rather than others. The successful cases were predominantly concerned with the lack of natural justice in the prison disciplinary system. Obviously, uh, this was home territory for judges who felt comfortable with dealing with these sorts of issues. Where the courts were much less willing to intervene were in cases concerning the legitimacy of prison conditions and the legitimacy of management decisions. There was, I think, a view that prison staff were doing a difficult job under difficult conditions and the courts took the view that they weren't going to add to those difficulties. So, from everything I've said, one point I want to, to really um, emphasise is that there were clear systemic reasons for prisoners to riot. It wasn't about the bad experience of a few, it wasn't about them, them being led astray by a few dominant prisoners. And the, the reasons for the, the, the riot, the systemic conditions, were long-standing. They weren't suddenly in crisis. These were chronic conditions. The, uh, the pressure cooker had been boiling away for many years. And of course, Rex's film and people like Eric with their experience are able to give testimony to that. So I'll end there. Thanks, Richard. Thank you very much, Elaine. Um, I mean, listening to your presentation, it does kind of feel that, you know, the prisons period in that situation were, the prisons were very much run as a kind of a screws prison, as, um, as, as, as some people already said, and there's, there's actually a question here from Bob Burrell asking that. Can you say a bit more about what it means to be a screws prison and what is different for better or for worse in today's environment? So I don't know if you have some thoughts about that, but I think the other thing is it wasn't just a screws prison, it was basically a prison service prison. You know, it was kind of run by the prison service on behalf of the prison service in their interests. And I, I'm, I'm wondering whether you feel much has changed in the intervening years. Well, I mean, I do think quite a lot has changed, although I think fundamentally the problems still remain. Um, I think the point that is, is important to make is that Yes, there are there were schools prisons, and certainly I, I've I've been in those and been been the butt of uh, some of that some of that behaviour that flows from that. But the important point is that they felt beleaguered, staff felt beleaguered, staff felt unsupported. There was a lack of leadership within the prison service, and I think if any kind of blame can be put, there was a lack of leadership. There was a lack of imagination. I think too that um, one could blame the academic community because we perhaps weren't as vocal as we could have been. There were a number of, of academic voices, but it really took the Wolf Report to start bringing these academic voices. We talked to each other about what was wrong, but we weren't really getting out there and making it clear. And so what I'm really trying to suggest is that there was, it was a muddle. It was a terrible mess. And it wasn't just a few bad people doing bad things. The problems were systemic. And I think the problems today that we have are still systemic. I think a lot of the problems uh, stem from the, the culture that assumes and continues to presume less eligibility for prisoners. Although we've seen a movement in terms of prisoners' rights, we've still got a very long way to go. We know, we've seen all of the debacle over the right to vote. 
prisoners are seen as non-citizens by a large number of people. And I think we need to open that debate as to why prisoners are citizens and why not only should they have the normal civil rights that are not normally taken away from somebody when they go to prison, but they should perhaps have special rights because of the peculiar vulnerability. Nowhere other than perhaps a secure mental hospital, a psychiatric hospital, is the power differential so great. So I think we need to really direct our attention to the systemic problems rather than to pick out individual groups that were behaving badly and contributed to the riot. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Elaine. Um, OK, we're going to move into uh, a bit of a Q&A session now. So what I'm asking is if uh, if Rex and Eric could rejoin us with their videos on, uh, but stay muted for now. And we're also going to be joined by by Joe Sim, um, who's going to act as something of a bit of a discussant as well in this in this section of the uh, of the, um, the 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 event. And I want to start with. Uh, a bit of a collection of questions. So there's a question here from Rianne who's asking, Eric, what is your opinion on the abolition of prisons? And this kind of theme about, you know, prison abolition, who should be in prison, who shouldn't, is something which is a theme in some of our other questions. So there's also a question from, from Dan, who's uh, talking a bit about his time working with young people at risk of falling into adult criminal justice system into pure pupil referral units and um, some of the cultures around that which which kind of maybe contributed to their risk of criminalization and also um, Carolyn who's um, Carolyn Willow who's one of our speakers a bit later this week who's asking specifically about Paul and about whether uh, because he wasn't really being treated as a child uh, whether this was part of the problem so um, I'm just wondering um, Rex would you like to start just with any further reflections on on Paul but then I think um, Eric Elaine and Joe if you have some some general thoughts about the process of criminalization the, the way to which individuals get sucked into the criminal justice system and and also in particular whether it's whether possibility of decarceration and maybe abolition of prisons is, is a possibility. Rex. <clears throat> Excuse me. I think Paul was a, a tragic example of attitudes that prevailed then, complete misunderstanding and unawareness of the need for childhood and that these young men brutalized um, coming from criminal subcultures were just <clears throat> left in, to, in the system, frankly, to, to get worse. And I think all that prison did was to make them worse, to in, in, imbue them with this, this, this crime culture, with, with the, the notion of them and us, and, and that society was there to be taken. Um, and uh, <clears throat> a tragic inability to, and the system, as Elaine was saying, and I think extremely well, the system just uh, thought of these people as, as you know, it's almost that attitude that exists, doesn't it? That we should punish people inside prison, not just sending them to prison. And I think the, the central question that I would like also to uh, have on board is our absolute uh, obsession with punishment in this country. How do we as a society deal with wrongdoing? And prisons have never caught up with that. They reflect, do they not, this inability of so many people to get beyond the tabloids, to get beyond the stereotypes that you have to deal with people as people. I just made a film, um, uh, you know, with James Timpson and looking at work and uh, prisons. And it's made me profoundly aware that if you give people no chance when they come out, if you reduce people's Employ, employability, you destroy their relationships, um, and there's sometimes so many of them don't have anywhere to go. All these factors play in to um, prisons being, frankly, a, a place where we as a society just fill it just inevitably. And we've got to stop thinking about prisons um, as, as, as these human warehouses and places of last resort. And that process of education still hasn't really happened. As for Paul, um, well, Paul is 
who was indeed a, a tragic example of all those factors I've been saying, and he, he never survived. Thank you. Thank you, Rex. Um, and related to that, really, then, uh, so the question really of, of youth imprisonment and uh, the argument, should we, uh, should we actually not be imprisoning young people at all and children in particular, uh, which Carolyn asks, and is, is sort of echoed by Dan's question, but also this broader question about, you know, a, a more kind of radical attempts to abolish prisons. Uh, Eric, do you have any, any thoughts on that kind of collection of questions? And, and Joe also, I think if you wanted to share any thoughts, I think that'd be really valuable. But Eric first. Uh, can you hear me? <clears throat> can. Yeah, um, a lot to think about there. Um, you know, does prison work? Um, and then with youth custody as well. I, I first entered the system <coughs> when I was 14. Um, short, sharp shock um, in a detention centre. Um, meant to frighten the life out of us and um, uh, and turn us away from a life of crime. Um, but even then I thought, <laughs> even as a 14 year old, I thought there was something odd because there I was behaving badly and I was behaving badly, you know, no question about it. And the courts were fed up with me, my third time I'd been in court. But then I thought to myself, well, is it really a good idea to lock me up in a in a place with a lot of other kids who are behaving badly? <laughs> it just it doesn't really make a lot of sense, you know. Um, and the problem is, well, so many problems with prisons, but basically it's a blanket treatment, you know. And if there's eighty-two or eighty-three thousand people in prison, then there's eighty-three different th thousand reasons why they're there. And yet the treatment is blanket. It just it just doesn't make sense at all. We've got to. I think we've got to come away. And of course, it doesn't work. We know it doesn't work. You know, we we see the reoffending rates, and you know, two thirds of young people reoffend within two years of release. And by the way, they're only the people who get caught reoffending. So you know, most uh, criminals, I certainly did, go out of their way <laughs> to avoid getting caught so even those figures um, are bad you know and you know would we have a um, an education system where two-thirds of the kids weren't educated when they left school would we have a, um, a health system where two-thirds of the patients didn't get better <laughs> and yet we and yet we carry on doing this we just seem to have this this passion for punishment and so what's your sort of answer to Rianne's question about prison abolition? Do you think that's a sort of a, even if it's a long-term goal, is that something that's worth considering or do you think there'll always be a need for prisons? I think realistically, there'll always be a need for people who present a danger, an absolute danger to society. But they're, relatively speaking, they're in a minority. Most of the people in prison they're nuisances, you know, to the public, uh, you know, by and large. But I think, uh, I think the idea that we that we can't send anybody to prison, um, it's it, it's a great ideal, you know. But uh, uh, realistically, what are you going to do with somebody who's who's committed appalling offences? You know, you, you know, society has to be protected from them. But if we if we stopped locking up the nuisances, you know, then we could concentrate um, and perhaps work towards rehabilitation because it doesn't exist. It doesn't exist now, rehabilitation. You know, people are rehabilitated occasionally, but they're rehabilitated despite the system, not because of it. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Joe, do you have any thoughts about that, that question about abolition which we will be coming to this question later in the week um, as well do you have any thoughts on that or, or just some reflections on uh, the points that um, Rex Elaine and Derek have made so far um, well thank you Richard and thank you for the questions are really 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 important um, what one point I'd like also to make about Paul which was incredibly incredibly moving um, then, in 1980 and now, raised profound questions about safety and protection. 
and the safety and protection of a young lad like that. And when we look at the levels of self-harm and self-inflicted death now, self-harm particularly in women's prisons and self-inflicted death in prisons now, those profound questions around safety and protection are still there. They haven't gone away. In fact, they've become intensified in the last 30 years. And so Rex's very powerful point about Paul not having a childhood stunted in an environment like that um, is reinforced and has been consistently reinforced um, over the last 30 years. And it's absolutely appalling the levels of self-inflicted death and self-harm inside at the moment and crucially as well which inquest and charity inquest and women in prison and others have identified and allied to that which i think we'll come to in friday the lack of democratic accountability it is absolutely appalling as well that the chief inspector of prisons recommendations are being simply ignored in a whole range of different areas so paul's case paul's appalling case and what happened to that lad really crystallized very, very poignantly, I think, the issues that we'll be addressing um, that have subsequently materialised over the last 30 years. In terms of the, the question of, of, of abolition, um, $64,000 question, um, I think the starting point should be we're spending £16 billion a year in the criminal justice system, £4 billion a year on prisons, and what are we getting from that? Now, that's not to turn human life into economic commodities. But it is to say there's a serious fundamental question, and Black Lives Matter movement have been talking about this as well, about the redirection of resources in the criminal justice system. Why are we spending so much money in this area for palpable failure um, at the end of the day? So that's kind of, that's the starting point. Now, what's interesting, I think, about the abolition debate, and, and this is one of the key differences, I think, between then and now as well, is that the level of political debate has become even worse now <laughs> than it was in those days, for the simple reason that if you even start to raise the issue, not just about abolition, but reform, politicians mobilise the offensive caricature that you're automatically pro-crime and anti-victim, which is absolutely offensive and it's absolutely outrageous. And it's because they don't have an answer to the question. So it's easy to label somebody, isn't it, you know, in, in, in those circumstances. So it seems to me there's a there's a sixty four thousand dollar question there about radical decarceration. Then the question becomes, well, if you need a system where some people have to be confined, but there's there's an interesting question to be asked about dangerousness itself and how how we conceptualise dangerousness, because many people who die at work, for example, which I think Steve Toombs will talk about later on in the week, die in dangerous circumstances, but the, 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 the people behind those circumstances are very rarely prosecuted as dangerous individuals. But in my experience, you know, the, the 70s, I saw in the Berlin Special Unit, Scotland's most dangerous men, as they were labelled by the press, being taken and fundamentally changed, fundamentally changed. That was an example of an abolitionist alternative. They changed, it was hard time for them, but they changed just as they did in Parkhurst Sea Wing and just as they're doing in Grendon Underwood. And yet the question remains, why was Parkhurst closed? Why was Berlin closed? And why has Grendon Underwood never been extended? And I think the reason for that is, is because it holds a mirror up to the criminal justice system to say, quote unquote, that media stereotype of the animals. They can change, but that does not suit the law and order mentality, the punishment narrative uh, that, that has gripped this country um, in so many ways. So I think there's a real case to be made for radical decarceration, stroke abolitionism. And that case can be made or should be able to be made outside of this dominant discourse of being pro-crime and anti-victim, which is absolutely offensive to everybody, I think, who's involved in the, the debate about prisons. So that's the thoughts initially, I think. And um, oh, sorry, one final point. Yeah, the issue about, um, sorry, beg your pardon, criminalisation. And that raises profound questions. Who gets criminalised in our society? And who doesn't get criminalised in our society? Why is the, 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 the laser focus of the criminal justice system always downwards and not upwards? at the hypocrisy and the harms generated by those who 
are in power in our society. And I think that's a really important question to be asked. Otherwise, we finish up repeating 200 years of failure, i.e. we focus downwards. And we need a less hypocritical debate about prisons as well. Sorry, I was banging on about that. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, yes, and as, as I mentioned earlier, we'll be discussing some of these questions, particularly around abolition and radical decarceration, at our final session on Friday. Um, Joe will be one of the speakers uh, alongside David Scott from the Open University, um, Andrew Albert, the president of the Prison Governors Association, and uh, Mary Corcoran, who's from Keele University. So if you haven't booked for webinar five, uh, there are still places available and um, please do so. Um, let's move on. Um, Elaine, there's a question specifically for you from Gainer and Indigo. Um, they say that you mentioned the systemic culture. How much do you think that this is linked to whoever is in government at the time? No, I don't think this is a party political issue particularly. Um, the, uh, the, the Conservatives, uh, well, if you think about when Labour came to power, when New Labour came to power, in the lead up to the election, both parties were out topping each other on the, on the criminal justice agenda. Criminal justice was way up the political agenda there. And they were both talking from the point of view, as Rex was saying, about perspective, that the perspective of punishment. Um, one of the, so I don't think uh, party politics changed. And I think that's one of the problems about why we haven't seen change, is that it doesn't really tap into some of the issues that the parties are really, are really interested and concerned with. But the other thing to bear in mind is that the problem with prisons is not just about what happens to people when they go to prison. The problem with prisons is that we send an awful lot of people there. And who send them there but our courts? And because of the separation of powers, we find politicians very reluctant to really tackle the courts. I mean, we had the 1991 Criminal Justice Act, which had as one of its purposes the reduction of short-term sentences. And that lasted for a very relatively very short period of time. Um, and, and I think that we've really got to address issues of sentencing if we really want to tackle some of the problems and refashion, as Joe was talking about, what prisons are for. We send people to prison, as in about three quarters of people who are entering prisons are going to be there for such short periods of time, you can't do anything with them. But it's long enough to disrupt the rest of their life to create more problems for them when they go out. So sentencing has got to be linked in to these discussions about prisons, where we go from here, and prison abolition. Do that again. Thank you very much, Elaine. Um, there's two questions which are kind of um, related questions, and they're currently our most popular questions. So it would be remiss of me not to uh, pose them. And one is from Alison Liebling, and one is from Rebecca Hollows. And they're, Rex, they're about different aspects of the reception of your filming and the film itself. So Alison's asking, how did prison staff respond to your presence? Um, were there staff who wanted things to be better? Of course, it relates also to the question about the screws prison. And there's been a few people who are saying, what is a screws prison? So if you wanted to also answer that question while you're doing that, that'd be lovely. Um, and then Rebecca's asking, um, how was the documentary received by the general public at the time? You mentioned it was 8 million people, I think, who, who watched it. But any kind of sense of how the public responded? And you'll need to unmute. strange process unmuting myself. Um, uh, it's a very interesting question from Alison. Um, the, it was a, the actual, uh, I think prisoners and were extremely glad that I, that I was able to reveal, you know, conditions, as I said in my, in my lecture that, um, had never been done before. And I think the overall response um, was a very positive one in a way, because, you know, truth were, was out there that we could actually see and, 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 and understand more what these grotesquely secretive places were, were like. And I think the, it, it begs the question of scrutiny. 
the actual institutions of the prison, I know that Alison's worked a lot in this, um, in which, you know, there is very little trust. They become jungles where, you know, people survive in all sorts of ways. Eric can certainly att attest to that. And, and he's, a, he's a, a wonderful example of someone who's defeated those terrible negative things. And many people do. I mean, there is a, a lot of contrast within the prison. And it's, it, it, in a, in, I did sort of hint at it. It's very unfair in a sense to, there's a lot of prison officers who care, who do care deeply about what they're doing um, and have changed prisoners' lives. I've heard it and documented it many times. Prison officers actually saying something to a prisoner, which sparked something and it began a, a, a change in their lives. So the attitude of prison officers is, is crucial in this. Um, but overcrowding uh, at that time, of course, was, was terribly, terribly difficult and, and, and made for, for such, such difficulties in, in, in bringing about rehabilitation. I think the re rehabilitation ideal is over, it's finished. Um, I agree with Martin Neri, who says that, look, make these places, not only reduce the prison population, but make them places which are safe, which are secure, to some extent, it was Joe was saying this earlier. And so people can at least have some time to think through what on earth has happened. But the idea that prison should be filled with people with minor offences, you know, is ridiculous. It hasn't worked. It doesn't work. It plainly doesn't work. Prison has to be a last resort for us in society. <clears throat> and um, what was the other point of the other question, Richard? The other lady who came. It was in. just this question about um, uh, well, how was it? How was how did the public receive? Yes, yes. The film. I got a very positive response. I, I remember at the time, people were glad to have seen this. They were shocked by it. Um, it led to a lot of people being interested in criminal justice. People joined the criminal justice system. Curiously enough, Martin Neri was one of them. He actually was watching it as a civil servant somewhere, and he joined. So. Uh, something like that <clears throat> did have a knock-on effect, and it does. But but it didn't, it, it hasn't, uh, as Elaine was ex ex explaining. The, the, the problems are sy sy systemic, and they are to do with our notions of punishment. And they are still based on the, on, on the tabloid response, which is that we, you know, we need to punish people. We don't want to understand what went on. We need to punish them because of fear and anxiety, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And I, I do want to say something about the future, if I, if I may, but perhaps in a, in a moment uh, after your next question. Or can I say it now? Go for it. Yeah, go on. <laughs> well, I wonder whether, <clears throat> in the light of the, the other uh, debates that are coming up in the week, I wonder, and I wonder what Ad Elaine and Eric think about this as well as Joe. Um, I think we should set an agenda. The, the, the prison reform community, NGOs, charities, ac ac academia, campaigners, should begin to think about a collective reform agenda. And if it's at all possible, I suggest that as a first aim, just as in the environmental movement, we should set a target to reduce the prison population by half by 2041. We should begin to frame the debate for politicians and the public. That's those of us who care deeply about the system. And you know, what are our collective aims? A massive investment in alternatives to prison, a public debate, as Elaine was saying, about sentencing, educational programs about crime. But above all, I think we, as a reform community, have got to be more um, proactive in what we believe I think are the are the are the main ideals and ambitions that we've got uh, to tackle. Frankly, what is still a crisis: eighty-three thousand people, as Eric outlined. You know, the failure rate is so profound. Is it time for us to gather our strengths and present this to the public, if we can all agree? From abolitionists to those who believe in in prison has a important effect in some ways in changing people's lives. Thank you for that opportunity. Thank you very much, Rex. And uh, uh, tease up beautifully. I mean, we, as an organisation, Centre for Crime and Justice Studies has a campaign called, an initiative called After Prison, which is precisely about trying to kind of work to think through 
different ways for using current prison place land on the basis that we can if we can close down prisons we can reduce the prison population but also use that land for more useful purposes so there's more information on our website about that initiative um, we're quickly running out of time and there's going to be some things that we can't address today i'm afraid so there's a question about what happened when the riot ended well we will be talking about that tomorrow so um, if you want to uh, talk more about the riot itself then or the protest then please do um, register if you haven't for tomorrow's event there's some questions there about what how different female prisons and male prisons are we don't have time to to talk about that today uh, but we will certainly uh, you know i'm sure we'll be coming back to some of those questions during the week there's a kind of a question here or a series of questions which in one sense are quite sort of granular but i think are not unimportant about prison complaint system and about accountability uh, including uh, you know did, would the protests have happened if the if the complaint system had been more robust if the inspection regime has been more robust i'd be interested in anyone's any any of joe rex eric or elaine's thoughts on that the, the importance of or injury is a robust inspection and complaint system important uh, for addressing problems in prison and as a way of not least of all about heading off probable problems ahead so would anyone like to offer some quick thoughts about that um, Elaine and Joe, I think maybe maybe Eric as well. Elaine, please, yes. Um, I, I was just going to say that. Uh, well, let, let Joe, Joe go first. I'll I'll try and collect my thoughts a little more. But let, let Joe go first. Oh, you sure. Not there. Okay. Just just very About thirty briefly. seconds, Joe. We're, we're quite yeah. short on time. Very briefly, the complaint system prisoners were disregarded and still are in many respects because they were socially constructed as liars. That's essentially it. And we saw it in, in, in Rex's film there, you know. And so the complaint system still needs to be dealt with. Massive overhaul, but it plugs into the thing I'll talk about on Friday, democratic accountability. And the fact that we're sitting here in 2021 and we don't have an accountable system which is manifested in terms of the complete ignorance of or the marginalisation of the Chief Inspector of Prisons recommendations, which are hardly earth-shattering, but are still ignored, says something profound about the culture of the prison service in general and the occupational culture of prison officers in particular. And I want to talk about that on Friday. Thank you, Joe. And um, Elaine and then Eric. I, I was simply going to say that if we just remember that the uh, whole tax riots had occurred the day before, when you have people who feel disenfranchised but have a grievance, when there is no way in which that grievance can be heard, then rioting becomes your only option. And so I, I think had there been better complaints, had there been a better complaint system that had provided effective remedies, uh, much of, much of the, the riot could have been avoided. Remember, it, it spread out right across the estate. So it was everybody in that pressure cooker feeling that enough was enough. The grievance system, there was no system of accountability for how they were being treated. Mm. And therefore, just as the poll tax rioters did the same when they felt the government was not listening to them, and all the other riots that we've seen since are largely due to people feeling nobody takes any notice of them, and this is a, a practice of last resort. Thank you very much. Eric, did you um, have some remarks? Uh, yes, I wanted to come back uh, very briefly on the, on the question of abolition it may well be pie in the sky because of the you know as i said before there are some people who represent a danger but i think we ought to really think long and hard before we send any child to prison because um the worst part of this job that i've got now is um is in dealing with young people. There's a boy who I think about most days, actually, um, a young boy called Adam Rickwood. He took his own life in a, in a secure training centre. Um, he wrote a long and detailed note uh, um, about why he was taking his own life. Um, and I think about him. I got to know him after he died, if you like, you know, and, um, uh, and he was a good kid. There was a lot of good in that kid, you know, and I think to myself um, how rich my life has been because I was 14 when, uh, when I went away and Adam was 14. Um, and I think that we got to the situation where this young boy, 100 miles away from home, 
um, and he had he felt he had no alternative but to take his own life. And um, I don't know. And then seeing Rex's film again and the child there, you know. So I think we really have to start with the children, you know. Um, and we ought to be able to make a case for not sending children to prison. Thank you very much, Eric. Um, we started with Rex, and I, I wanted to just finish with Rex. Uh, Rex, I mean, you you did your original film uh, back in 1980, or it was it was broadcast in 80 with the, the protest the decade on. You uh, returned to Strange Ways uh, 20 years on. Um, what do you think you'd find now if you went into prison? So do you think it would be much the same? Do you kind of have a sense that anything would have changed? I don't think a great deal has changed in terms of attitudes. I think, um, you know, I showed and depicted, frankly, uh, conditions which were intolerable and uh, an affront to decency. And much of that, in a sense, has changed, that, as we were talking about. So living conditions, um, certainly up till COVID, um, were, I think, getting better. And I think there is, you know, there are people working toward that. We must be. We, the prisons have got to be as safe and as uh, as possible. Um, and they are, in many ways, unsafe. And COVID, of course, is. I wonder what that will do to the public. Make them more aware of of um, of, of loneliness, of isolation. And you would think about men um, and, and women being locked up for so long. So. Um, the, the fundamental problems haven't changed. The, the debate really does go on. And as I was saying earlier, we've got to, we in the prison reform community, have got to help frame that more effectively. Um, and, you know, 83,000 people in 2021, come on. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, Rex. And thank you to all our speakers. Uh, well, that concludes today's webinar. Tomorrow, we're going to be focusing particularly on the Strange Ways protests. So if you want to know more about what happened there in the immediate aftermath and repercussions, not least of all for the prisoners themselves, then uh, do come along tomorrow. If you haven't registered, there's still time to register and you can do so via our website. Um, I'd very much like to thank all the speakers and all our attendees and, and all those who made donations when they were registering. Uh, these things uh, don't come at no cost at all. So we really appreciate the, the financial support for running this series of webinars for, from, from everybody who's, uh, who's given some money. Uh, everyone should receive a follow-up email from us a bit later on today, uh, including links to the video. If we can get it edited in time, it will certainly be edited over the next few days. Uh, and also a feedback form. Uh, we're asking as many of you as possible to, 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 feed, um, to fill in that form. It's really helpful for us to know what went well from your perspective and what didn't go as well. We had over 40 questions uh, today, and I'm really sorry we couldn't uh, get to all of them. And I think that's one sign of things going well, but you know, it's a shame we didn't have a chance to, ask, um, to answer all those questions. So thank you very much uh, for being with us today. And I look forward to seeing many of you tomorrow in the subsequent webinars. Goodbye.